Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar. Um, I am Casey Kochi, the Marketing Director of Focal Point, and I appreciate you all taking the time to, uh, to join us today. I know it's been a, a crazy few weeks for everybody in our industry, uh, and we uh, sincerely appreciate you taking the time um, out of your day for this. Uh, our topic today is something I know is top of mind for many of our clients uh, and many business leaders out there. How do you secure your workforce when everything is remote? Uh, I know everyone's been faced with this challenge uh, over the last few weeks in, in um, some form or fashion. Uh, last week, we held sessions on security operations during a crisis, as well as strategies for scaling multi-factor authentication to support these new work patterns. If those are of interest to you, both of those sessions are available on demand uh, right now on focalpoint.com. Uh, but today we turn our attention to other pressing issues, namely, how do you secure the remote workforce without adding new roadblocks? How do you enforce BYOD policies outside of the office? How do you quickly and securely onboard new workers when you can't meet with them in person? Uh, to answer these questions, we'll turn to today's presenters, Asif Sayed and Stephanie Hagopian. Asif is a director in Focal Point's technology integration practice. He's a thought leader and subject matter expert in the field of IAM. He has extensive experience solutioning and implementing IAM systems and platforms for uh, both on-prem on and cloud environments. He also has deep experience with IDAS systems, PAM systems, data governance, and SIM systems. Uh, Asif is joined by Stephanie Hagopian. Stephanie has more than 15 years of experience working in the IAM industry. Uh, has worked with hundreds of clients uh, on helping them establish and implement IAM programs through various levels of maturity. Uh, she is the Vice President of Sales with Focal Point's Technology Integration Practice. Uh, I want to thank you both for joining us today and for preparing this presentation. And I want to thank all of our attendees uh, for taking the time out of their day uh, for this session. And with that, I'll turn it over to Asif and Stephanie. Great, thank you so much, Casey. And thank you everyone who uh, was able to join today. Um, so I'm starting out with a, a, a scary picture and I apologize ahead of time for that. I, part of me cringes at the idea of beating people over the head with you know, even more talk about COVID-19 and all the bad things that are happening as a result of you know, what, is, what is truly a global pandemic. I think everyone who's joined on today's session has gotten a fair share of scary news related to this disease. Um, it has certainly changed all our lives in a pretty profound way. Um, you know, we're now putting groceries into staging areas before they enter our homes. Um, we're wearing face masks outside. We can't let our kids play in a park. Um, life is pretty strange <laughs> and stressful and frightening. Um, I'm, I'm sure everyone kind of feels the same way, uh, except for our dogs. Uh, for those of you who have dogs, I, I would be one of them. The dogs are rejoicing, and I think mine's pretty smug about this right now because uh, she gets to hang out with me all the time. Um, so I promise you, I, we're not showing you this to raise your blood pressure, but these are, these are examples of reports that are coming out. These two images in particular have come out of a Goldman Sachs report, um, and those the financial analysts at Goldman are basically saying, as many are, and what we probably all already know is that um, closing down businesses across the country as a result of COVID-19 has drastically uh, affected the economy. We're all bracing, I think, uh, from if you if you do run on a fiscal year, uh, for example, Focal Point does. Q2 is not going to look great for the country. From a GDP perspective, Q2 is certainly going to have an effect on um, uh, is is already experiencing an effect because business has has closed. Um, the good news, and what these charts are showing you, is that there will be a recovery. And even though right now we're experiencing a fallout just because nobody's open and running for business from a brick and mortar perspective, there will be a, uh, a resurgence of business and that business will resume a normal state in Q3 and that we will experience growth, uh, not just within our country, but globally, um, you know, from Q3 on, you know, into 2021, assuming that businesses will be able to reopen soon, which all of us are fearing will happen. We will not be in this state forever. Um, not surprisingly, if you look at this information, the services industry is definitely suffering most. Hospitality is getting hit hard because travels come to a complete halt. Uh, retailers, you know, of course, close their storefronts um, and we don't really know when they're going to be able to reopen. So I think all of us are acutely aware, especially if you work in these industries yourselves, and some of you on the phone may, may actually work in one of those industries. Um, but for many of us, myself included, um, so many businesses are able to still work remotely and continue to be productive. Um, fortunately, we're managing to do this uh, in a way that mitigates the financial impacts of COVID-19. And as a result, 
I think across the board, if you're able to continue your business remotely, productivity has truly become the number one priority for businesses that can sustain themselves through a remote workforce. For those of us who are in the security realm, which most of you are probably all in that boat, if you join today, um, remote access uh, usually makes us cringe at the best of times, right? Um, much less in the middle of the pandemic. Now that 100% of users are remote, it's probably no shock to anyone on this webcast that many security concerns are already arising. Most businesses were never prepared um, to shift everybody, the entire workforce, as well as their contingent workforce to an 100% remote model. You know, I know as a business focal point, we are consultants. So a lot of times we do things remotely, but we don't do everything remotely, nor, you know, have we traditionally supported that model. You know, we love collaboration. We love going on site and seeing our clients. We love doing, you know, design sessions and whiteboards. And a lot of that um, is a little harder to do when you're doing it remotely. Um, most of our clients have actually been communicating with us and telling us that the shift has been so rapid and hasty that um, it, it was done very intentionally because they wanted to limit the financial impact to the business. But that rapid change certainly has had, um, you know, security impact. And as a result, you know, most organizations that we know seem to be repurposing their IT security staff to prioritize work from home related security changes. Um, and, and, possible but anything that's done in emergency capacity is never going to be graceful it's never going to be perfect right um some of the challenges stem from a cultural mindset set shift for certain um others are more practical in nature like dealing with the logistics we've heard this a couple times from our clients that the first thing they did was look at their vpn access they looked at their licensing model they looked at their infrastructure even more importantly to see if they could sustain uh, a VPN increase, you know, an increase in bandwidth and an increase in access um, for way more, you know, way higher kind of bandwidth uh, requirements than what they're used to. Uh, because they knew that everyone was gonna start using remote video conferencing, remote collaboration tooling, uh, not to mention that it, there's a personal aspect to this, that there's increased stress that everybody is feeling on a personal level being stuck at home. <laughs> and this is more of the, the cultural level, right? Uh, folks are stuck at home, they're with their families. In many cases, they're in homes that do not at all support a work from home lifestyle comfortably, especially when you have two working people in one household. Um, and even more so if you've got kids who want to stream video games all day long. I know a lot of people <laughs> who are in that situation personally. Um, or, it, you know, you might be lucky and not homeschooling your children if you have children, in which case, uh, they might actually be using things like Zoom or WebEx or what have you to connect to their school environments and be able to learn all day. Either way, it's probably uh, pretty likely that most of you are maxing out your home Wi-Fi. <laughs> um, uh, so I guess I'll say that for this presentation, Asif and I will try to talk slowly. We'll try to advance these, these slides slowly so that everyone can kind of keep with that. But I, I've seen a lot of technical difficulties arise as of late, even though we're just doing you know, remote meetings and such. <laughs> so um, this quote, you know, there, this is just, uh, and I'll read out to you, the work from home dynamic creates a very opportunistic situation for hackers and fishers. Every home device or wireless connection is a potential entry point. Hackers are taking advantage of individuals' fear and need for health, safety, and financial aid information. There's no doubt there's a psychological toll on what is happening that is forcing people to find ways to make this shift as easy as possible on themselves. It's just human nature. Most normal people just want to remain relevant. They want to remain productive in their jobs, and they're going to find the easiest way of ensuring they do those jobs effectively. Even if it means they're going to use, you know, I hate to use the shortcut, but I'm going to talk about that in a moment, because the word shortcut is literally the worst thing you can hear as a security professional. Um, but those shortcuts, you know, kind of have to happen for folks to be able to, to stay relevant in their jobs, but it does inherently create security weaknesses. And it directly affects your company's security posture, and certainly your risk of data exposures. At the same time, you know, per this, the quote that I have up in front of you, external hackers and fishers are absolutely jumping on the opportunity to exploit corporate infrastructures that are straining under the weight of this working model. We've seen instances of it already, there's active um, exploitation already going on by the hacker and the phishing community. 
And that's just because the adaptation pace can't withstand what hackers are doing to, to find exploits now in the midst of what is, like I said, a global crisis. And these hackers and the fishers, they realize that people are doing not so secure things right now. They're looking to take advantage of people's just inherent desire to seek out, um, you know, even beyond the productivity factor. You know, folks are doing what they need to do to do their job as, as efficiently as possible. But then there's the personal aspect. Everybody's scared. Everybody's stressed out. They're looking up on the internet all the time. Health information, financial aid information on the web. A lot of times it's the black web, the dark web. They're looking at... Um, you know, sites from China because China's where it got started and they're looking at um, Italy and Spain and reports from all over the globe to try to um, find out more about what's happening from a health perspective and what data is out there. And naturally they might be hitting sites that aren't so secure. They might accidentally be getting onto you know, dark web type stuff and there's, there's, um, you know, there's uh, exploits there. Um, and unfortunately a lot of folks are doing that from the personal devices. And unfortunately, right now, we have to assume that personal devices are corporate devices. And what I mean by that is a lot of folks are moving information over to their, their personal devices that might have a corporate footprint. Uh, a lot of people are just using their personal devices to do their job. And then at the same time, they're doing stuff like working on the web to see what's going on with coronavirus. Um, and unfortunately, like I said before, there's a lot of, um, a, a lot of security implications. So with that, because it reminds me a lot. I want to hand it over to Asif for a second. Um, you know, I already mentioned that before shortcuts. Asif, do you mind providing some examples of what kind of shortcuts people should really be wary of, especially security professionals, you know, folks in our position? What what should individuals in an IT security um, um, capacity really be wary of, you know, for, for their workforce, as well as their contingent workforce, what they're doing um, uh, in a work from home situation? Yeah, hi, hi everybody. Um, hope you all can hear me okay. This again, this is uh, Asif. Um, I'm like most of you in IT. You know, I have a habit of working from home. For me, it isn't a big deal. But uh, sometimes with the kids home, I for one ran to the farthest corner of my home trying to find a spot and hoping my kids don't knock at my door. But in case if you hear it, you know why. Uh, so we talk. <laughs> So talking about shortcuts, right? So we, we, we are in a unique situation where organizations um, are mostly IT. They all have an IT division and they're probably prepared for their IT workforce to be able to log in remotely, apply patches, you know, and things like that. But, I, you know, they may not be in a situation to support uh, remote login or remote um, collaboration for the entire workforce. So, so they are in a situation to rapidly uh, you know, enable their workforce to do so. Uh, they may not be an organization that that are hand, handing it or handing it or uh, you know their own laptops, which are naturally hardened and secure to their workforce. So these workforce are ending up using their own personal devices to get to to access it. So, uh, so while they do it, they also are using their corporate collaboration devices. They are sh sharing screens uh, while they are, you know, getting their work done. They are attending video conferences, and you know, uh, and they are using their own cloud tools. For in some cases, I'm sure you you've seen some funny videos, um, you know, circulating on the internet as well. So what they, what they are doing uh, during all of these, uh, knowingly or unknowingly, is they are syncing and storing business information on personal cloud accounts. Um, most most of these workforce may not have a clear delineation of their work and personal uh, lives in terms of their you know in access to internet, access to their workforce is concerned. Now it's even more challenging with them using their personal devices to get this done. Um, they are probably uh, using unsecured connections to employer systems. So, for example, case in point, uh, if you're living in the New Jersey, Pennsylvania area, uh, you, every, there is Comcast everywhere and there are Xfinity hotspots, right? You may be using uh, those hotspots because your Wi-Fi is already jammed with, uh, with your kids uh, and your adult kids having uh, multiple sessions of, um, you know, TVs running with Netflix. Um, your, your, your spouse is also using the network and you're, you're ending up using that because it's, it's not reliable anymore. Uh, during this process, you're also misusing conference line, maybe using it for personal use as well. Uh, we heard about how Zoom is all over in the news uh, because it's they, the researchers have found that it's easy to, 
to get access to your meeting pin and snoop into your meeting. We may not be setting up passwords to such meetings. Uh, we are also using um, our own personal devices, which uh, which are um, unsecured and may not have proper antivirus or mal malware detection softwares. Uh, we may be using some, in the means of finding shortcuts, we may be ending up using some unsecured and unvetted cloud tools as a means of shortcut to getting the work done fast. And, and all of these comes in a cost, and the cost is um, is a fodder for these attackers who are snoop who are looking into every single opportunities and gaining uh, access to corporate systems, sensitive data, and so on. Steph, back to you. Yeah, great, thanks, Asif. So, you know, we we were stating a lot of the issues, but really the point of today's session is we wanted to we wanted to give everyone. Um, a sense of the things you can do in the near term right now with you know, the, the tools you have in place within your organization, the policies you've already built in your, com in your company, that there are some things you can do immediately to address a lot of these, um, you know, a lot of these potential um, exploits or uh, potential exposures right, within the organization right now because you've shifted to work from home. So really today, like everything we wanna talk about is really focused on what can you do right now to try to mitigate this? And, and there's also long-term stuff you can do as well. We'll hit on both, but really we wanna to try to give you as much uh, information as possible about what you can do right now you know, as an organization to try and mitigate this risk. But before we even dive into the specific use cases that we want to address around this. We want to kind of level set that you really have to think about the risk that the risk potential that's occurring right now uh, from, from two perspectives. One, the nature of the data that's being shared or exposed or accessed by your user community, and then really looking at the people involved in that user community. I think most security professionals know that not all risk is created equal. Um, there's somewhat of a hierarchy of risk, and that's the image you're looking at right now is that higher hierarchy of risk that needs to be recognized when it comes to remote access. And it's all based on how much control you have over a particular user base and what the sensitivity level is of the data that's being accessed. So at the bottom of the risk scale, it's a little mis, uh, misleading in the sense that we agree green usually means A-OK, -okay, and it's never A-OK. -okay. I think every security person knows there, like even standard use is not uh, uh, without risk, right? But it is low risk. Um, and it's low risk because normal everyday standard users, these are your employees uh, who are quote standard are probably just checking email, they're setting up their go-to meetings or their WebEx meetings or Zoom meetings. They're sharing files with standard information on it. They probably don't have many privileged or any privileged system access rights. Basic VPN access is probably more than sufficient for these folks to carry on and do their jobs every day, you know, even now that they're in a remote model. One step above that in the second square, that privileged user, it, they're considered fairly higher risk just because even though they're workforce folks, they're your, your employees, they're accessing privileged accounts. So these would be your DBAs, your application admins, your server admins. The nature of the data that they're accessing makes them higher risk, even if you could technically enforce security measures for those users, because I, you know, in many cases and many organizations, make sure that these types of users can only access systems on registered or authorized work devices. And there's software as well as policies that can control that, um, kind of a mixture of both, and we'll get into those details in a second. But usually you have some sort of control mechanism in place for those users already. Um, kind of getting into the higher, Tier of risk are really your privileged users that are contractors and external vendors. So contractors who access non-privileged systems certainly won't be as risky as those who do access privileged systems, but they're all high risk because you don't have control over that user population. They could be using third-party corporate devices uh, to log into your systems, or they could be using their own personal devices if you don't happen to have those um, third-party vendor risk management policies in place, you know, where you're enforcing something different. Um, and some folks do have more robust third-party vendor risk policies than others. We've noticed a lot of that has already happened in the past 18 to 24 months, in which case a lot of that would be into effect right now and helping you mitigate that. Um, so if you don't already have it, there's you know a level of due diligence that probably should be applied at this point. And again, we'll provide some specific examples in a moment. Um, but maybe, I, Austin, if you don't mind kind of going a little more into why external vendors in particular who access privileged systems are 
in the red. <laughs> if you could talk about that, and then I can talk about this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so in my my career, um, you know, uh, even more so recently, uh, two of the important concepts I kind of live by is uh, when it comes to uh, my work is uh, principle of uh, zero trust, and uh, which basically means that you you don't trust anything, but you verify everything, right? The second concept I, uh, I really like is the principle of least privilege, which kind of centers around an identity. So by which you essentially are saying that you want to make sure that you, you apply uh, or assign access to users or accounts to the, only the resources they absolutely need to get their work done. So these two concepts kind of are, you know, are hanging in, in, in the air, if you will, for organizations that are not necessarily prepared in this climate. Right, they are scrambling their way into um, uh, getting their a getting their workforce uh, to enable them to work remote, um, and then uh, and they also may man have to manage their privilege access as well. This problem is like compounded when you have an external vendor logging in from their personal devices um, in order to gain access uh, gain privilege access into your critical or sensitive system. Um, a case in point would be a health, healthcare organization, right? You, you constantly have these vendors who need to troubleshoot a clinical system in a hospital. Their standard operating procedure could have very well be that they are physically present in the hospital, uh, but to, due to everything that is going on, uh, they have to remotely log in to, to get their work done, right? This, this presents us a lot of issues. The customer may not have or the healthcare organization may not have a strong identity provider that can do some smart intelligent authentication that considering keeping in multiple factors in, 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 in consideration. Um, and, and, and not only that, the, uh, you know, the organizations may also be, uh, with the lack of all the organizations are probably scrambling to give uh, access right away to these external vendor populations because they want this medical equipment to be fixed ASAP, which we all know why. Uh, and, you know, this is kind of where we have uh, challenges because the, you know, lack of data classification or access classification uh, will end up resulting in these vendor users resulting in more access than what they need. Um, so, which is why, you know, in this slide you see this vendors or even consumers are at the high risk uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, gaining access to the system and more so than ever before. Yeah, and we can't, I mean, we can't forget that, it, it, and you're right, external vendors are incredibly high risk. I, you know, I, it's probably debatable whether them or consumers are more. The only reason we kind of put consumers at the very, very top is because they're, A, there's a sheer volume of access that occurs with consumers, right? There's just a whole lot of them hitting your e-commerce portal if you have one. Um, and, and, I, and I think it, right now in this situation in particular, it's high alert for consumers because now that brick and mortar stores are closed, we can only anticipate that online slash e-commerce activity is scaling up, right? Um, and, and just because it's scaling up and there's more users hitting those sites, it's higher risk inevitably because there's more of them. And even more importantly, you have no control over the devices that those folks use. I mean, workforce is one thing because you can, you know, we know what devices they're using and and as an organization we can control that to some extent when it's a vendor you've got vendor risk policies and certain control mechanisms in place for them your vendor community in general but consumers are doing whatever consumers want you know they're they're accessing your stuff and you don't know what kind of a device they're using and if their child's using that device at the same time right um, they're they're basically accessing your websites from wherever or however. So security controls are tantamount in importance because even when there's no pandemic, consumers um, are, are a high risk community, right? Um, and, and now that they can only access your services remotely, they're just an extremely high risk group that you have to think about and contend with. And I think much of what we're gonna talk about today really keys into that consumer. I would say generally speaking, as we sort of walk through recommendations, uh, there's a lot of stuff we're going to talk about that's sort of low, uh, it's, it's um, low touch, it's low impact to an end user, meaning it's it's stuff you can do on the back end 
um, to be able to see what people are doing. Um, and we'll talk about AI is you know, primo on everyone's list now. Um, but the great thing about mechanisms like uh, like artificial intelligence and machine learning is that your consumers have no idea that you're doing it and not in a creepy way, but just in a, you know, we don't know where they're coming from and what they're doing. So it's really important to see if they're doing something that's um, uh, out of out of pattern, you know, and, and raises red flag internally within the organization and just alerts to someone that something's going on. Mm. And so I, we wanted to start with kind of the low hanging fruit recommendations. Um, we know a lot of organizations are already doing this, but uh, you know, we BYOD has been around for a while and BYOD policies have certainly become more robust um, over time. But you know, one of the things that we would say you do immediately if you haven't already done it is, is look at your BYO, BYOD policies. Um, you know, the purpose, like I said, of today's session is to help you understand what you can do now. <laughs> uh, we're not completely expecting you to revamp your technology infrastructure and way of doing business. That's totally unrealistic, but there's lots of things you can probably do in the near term to mitigate risks associated with a new work from home model. BYOD is going to be your strongest security inflection point, or it could potentially be your weakest inflection point. Um, our recommendation, if you haven't already done so, is to make a proactive effort to enforce your existing BYOD policies and to review what policies you already have in place to ensure they're adequately protecting your corporate assets. So, you know, some examples would be uh, preventing your business information from being stored on personal cloud accounts, right? You can set up some policies to ensure, just to make people proactively aware. We know some organizations just reminding folks of BYOD policies by sending out notifications either to the internal portal or really doing a personal communication from a C-level executive, just listing out what the policies are. It's just a gentle and friendly reminder for your workforce to adhere to these policies. In lots of cases, this is not people intentionally trying to do bad things, which is usually the case. You know, a lot of people aren't meant, are trying, especially internally, are trying to do something um, uh, um, bad per se but they're they're just shortcutting you know they're trying to find the path of least resistance to get their job done and they're forgetting that they should not exactly be storing any business information on their personal cloud accounts um even if they're having to wait a little bit to get proper access in place through your organizational controls um using secure vpn is huge or uh, multi-factor authentication mechanisms like a duo push notification a google authentication Free. Uh, there's a lot of MFA out there that you can leverage uh, to access critical corporate assets remotely that you guys could instantiate. Strengthening your password policies is huge. Um, you know, if you, I, we know some cases where folks are instigating a um, kind of forcing a password policy change. You know, they're making folks to reset their passwords a little more frequently or they're strengthening their password policies right now just because they know that uh, user authentication is becoming even more important. Um, corporate assets. Ensuring personal devices have the latest antivirus software, something that uh, Asif already kind of mentioned. Um, updating your breach data breach response plan is huge. So this is in case something does happen, which for, you know hopefully it will not, but in case something does, just making sure that those response plans are in place so that you can react quickly if something, if something occurs with any anyone in your user base. Um, and then the final item is actually about collaboration tooling in general. As of, um, uh, what should people worry about when it comes to collaboration software that you haven't already mentioned? Because <laughs> you, know, you, you hinted at it already. Sure. Sure, yeah. Collaboration softwares are great. I, I actually love them. Um, you know, softwares like Slack and Teams have risen greatly in popularity. Uh, these days, you know, primarily because they, they do a, such a wonderful job bridging the gap between us or the workforce working physically in an office and us uh, or the workforce working remotely at home or elsewhere. Uh, you know, they, they come with significant advantages in users. I, for one, I'm particularly a big fan of Microsoft Teams, they, in, you know, as to how in terms of the the uses that it, it, it gives me, how easy for me is to collaborate with my team and so on in a project. Uh, but they also bring in risk and you know, some some things we should be aware of. It, it, so, for example, these days, you know, a, a malicious attacker does not have to fish for uh, for loopholes, if you will. They they most of them know that uh, you know a the workforce are working remote close to 100%, and b they are all are using these collaboration software such as Teams, Slack, Google, etc. Um, not only that. 
these hackers and cyber criminals are very acutely aware of the wealth of sensitive information that could be shared via such workplace collaboration tools, right? You could be sharing your uh, financial information through these, you could be sharing other sensitive information there through these that could affect your company and, and what is coming next. Uh, the another potentially concerning vulnerability could appear from a third party apps that are integrated with these. These apps, uh, they have API hooks that you can integrate these apps with. Um, they, they give a very seamless integration capabilities that you have some automation, your RPA tools or anything, they can basically um, you know, act as a bot uh, through externally where, where, where your workforce can come and interact with the bot. Not only that, they could also be a source for, uh, for informing other things through an automated way as well. Uh, while all of this is great, uh, what this all means is once an attacker gains access, these attacks can be both at the personal because you're using your own device and at an organization level because these collaboration tools have give you access to these organization um, uh, level of data. Uh, once attack, once gained access, the, these attackers can you know you know have full access to your personal device, your personal information, and not only that, coupled with that, with your other sensitive corporate document or files as well. Uh, both of which I'm sure we all know that is dangerous. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so <laughs> I just talked about password policies being strengthened, but I'm going to throw this one out there. I'm sure many folks on the phone looking at this webcast have heard about the, the, the late, it's not a trend, the imperative to move to a passwordless authentication model. Um, this is not a whim. This is not just something vendors are saying. Um, authoritative bodies have really started pushing for several years now, I think it was 2017 that um, NIST first published uh, really getting rid of passwords or moving away from a password-based authentication model as being a best practice and part of a security controls mechanism, you know, especially for identity and access management. Many other um, controlling bodies have followed that same path. Um, this, this crisis, COVID-19, is making a very strong business case for getting rid of passwords. Um, Asif, I, you know, is there a way to kind of to kind of tear out and, and we can talk about it, you know, I, kind of in a general sense, and we can get into specifics in a in a in a moment around passwordless authentication. But what, generally speaking, is the business case right, for getting rid of passwords, um, especially as it relates to just uh, how consumers are affected by it or how end users are affected by it? Sure. Um... You know, we, we, we all are security professionals and, and security is, is considered a deterrent, right, against these uh, bad actors out that are out there. At the same time, uh, you know, unfortunately, security personnel are the most hated in, in an organization as well. And it's primarily because they put a basically, uh, you know, they create a brick wall in front of them that you cannot do this, that, or, or something else. And it is, this ends up being uh, making the lives of the workforce a little difficult. Um, you know, one of my favorite podcasts that I periodically listen to is a CISO vendor relationship podcast. There are a bunch of CISOs get on and, and they, it's, it's great them talking uh, as to how um, security should be business friendly. Uh, while you should make your business completely secure and there's no exceptions to that, you also should, should, should strive with making your, um, the workforce's life easier, right? And that's where you know passwordless authentication, other smart authentication, um, you know, comes in play. Uh, what we are trying to say is organizations must make their employees' life easier, uh, while especially these days when they are working remote, and to be effective, right? Because you want to make sure the business is run close to normal as possible. Uh, to that end, organizations must invest in products and tools that support, for example, the FIDO standards that leverage biometrics uh, for authentication, such as fingerprints, touch ID, for example, or even implement passwordless login, uh, passwordless login into consideration, right? Um, where uh, you, you cannot expect them using, you cannot expect them to use corporate um, devices to not have them enter the password and just gain access but at the same time um, you know move away from from a user entering a password to something like uh, you know a, a push type notification to a device a duo octa or what have you can do that 
Um, here, for sensitive applications or applications that are slightly considered secure or high secure, we can couple that with the two-factor authentication that uh, not only ensures that the access is easier, but also security is applied as well. Um, you know, make two-factor authentication or multi-factor authentication for all logins across all associated software, not just your email or collaboration software, et cetera. Um, you know, make sure you have strong policies uh, that control the ability for users who are, once they gain access, they, 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 that they cannot download these files. Uh, and, and all of this is important. Uh, you sh we should also make, a, um, organizations should make a careful effort is to constantly educate their employees as to why all this is being done uh, and how they should make uh, uh, a boundary between their personal use and the business use uh, while they're accessing their own devices. Uh, educating, they should educate their employees in, in cybersecurity best practice and why, um, you know, um, having a strong company policy in terms of what is accepted and, uh, and how they can couple that with the highly regulated access to companies' um, critical data can incredibly in help organizations uh, with their cybersecurity posture. Yeah, I mean, the Verizon breach report, I'm sure a lot of folks are familiar with this. Last year, they said that compromised credentials are actually responsible for over 80% of breaches. It's unbelievable, but that's, you know, most of the breaches that we hear about. It's the number one reason why they're happening. It's username and password exploits. Um, and and honestly, that I think that's why, you know, NIST and other governing bodies like ISO, um, there are a lot, you know, a lot of um, compliance regulations and such have really started recommending that passwordless authentication at the very least be a step-up mechanism in addition to that basic username password combination but eventually replace it and like no one's saying you can replace passwords right now i mean obviously right now is not the time to do that overnight you don't you never want to do that overnight there's so much uh end user communication and change management that has to go on before you can instantiate a change like that but to start thinking about the plan you're going to put in place to eventually get to that point, that is the future. Especially now that we've got biometrics and mechanisms that are really um, uh, way more secure, there and it increases end user you know, usability um, to employ those, those methods versus username and password. We've known forever that passwords don't work half the time. You know, even when you enforce strong security policies around your passwords, um, folks forget them all the time. They write them down all the time. They still do. They have been for years. They continue to do so. Everyone always uses and rotates the same passwords. Again, even when you put in a password policy that forces rotation, so you can't use the same password, you know, more than, like, you can't ever use the same password again. Uh, even when people, do, when you do that, folks find a workaround by changing an exclamation point to a question mark at the end of their password. You know, it's stuff like that. Um, that just really renders passwords in general as being a weak security mechanism when it comes to access controls. Um, you know, I know you're, you're uh, and as if there's the, I, when it comes to authentic passwordless authentication options, you already kind of uh, mentioned a few of those in succession. I want to give you a chance to, to mention a few more. Um, but you know, I think. I think uh, what we're seeing a lot of is, is those multi-factor authentication controls, risk-based authentication, and maybe you can define what that is for everybody in just a moment. Um, and, and also uh, user entity behavior analytics, we're seeing a big rise in using that as a passwordless authentication method as well. So do you mind talking a little more in a little more detail about that risk-based authentication concept and user entity behavior and at behavioral analytics, Yuba, and what uh, those two technologies in particular, what, um, you know, why were we seeing a rise in those as being, you know, kind of a next yeah. generation option? Sure. Um, yeah. Th thanks, uh, Stephanie. And uh, before that, let me also just quickly interject. Um, you know, we, we talked quite a bit about passwordless, and I think Steph, uh, Stephanie hit the nail about we cannot you know, if, as much as we all want to, we cannot be moving out of a passwordless world, right? Um, you know, and what is important at this time is companies should also, you know, make sure entering a password is also easier. Have their use, you know, make sure um, all users have access to a corporate version of things like Dashlane, LastPass, et cetera, uh, where users can maybe start using passphrases and then system generated password. They don't even have to know what their password is. They can leverage these, these utilities to enter a password. 
Um, so in addition to that, uh, we, we talked about MFA and risk-based authentication. We, we all know what is MFA. What risk-based authentication is, is, um, is you making sure uh, additional characteristics of a user is also uh, taken into consideration while authentication. Uh, things like a user themselves, who is this type of user, uh, internal user, external users, vendor user, uh, customer. Not only that, you should also consider the device and the location that are you logging in should also be used in consideration. And each of these uh, behaviors should, should force a user uh, for multi-factor authentication uh, when they are accessing uh, privileged systems. Not only does MFA should be at the periphery or at the login level, but it also should be embedded within the application itself. Um, for example, uh, user accesses VDI, um, you, you validate who the user are, user enters MFA, but if inside their VDI session, they, they're launching a privileged session in, uh, through PuTTY or a remote desktop to a, through a system, even MFA should also be considered uh, at that point as well to, to make sure your access is secure. Um, so, so that's an example of how you can consider uh, factoring risk uh, when you're enforcing MFA. The last one is UEBA also knows user entity behavior and analytics, right? Is is basically you're you're capturing the behavior of the user uh, while they are logging in. So example would be uh, a user always logs in through a specific location, specific device, and then suddenly you, you're seeing um, their, their pattern changing. Um, you know, it could be a logging in from a different geography or accessing from a different device and so on. And MFA should be enforced during that as well. So, and analytics information should also be these days. Systems are quite quite a lot of systems that are there that they can enforce and then they they can uh, they can enforce and leverage UEBA features to while they're uh, while enforcing authentication. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Asif. So, um, privileged user management is another another one that we wanted to touch on. Um, since any access to privileged resources, like we already said, is inherently higher risk. So MFA is definitely, um, it's universally recommended as a great mitigation control um, and should be part of that step-up authentication mechanism in front of any system that houses privileged information. Uh, but to be honest, MFA should really be your bare minimum security requirement for privileged information access. Ideally, you wanna be using uh, what's called a privileged access management or PAM solution. If you don't already have one in place, examples of PAM solutions include like a CyberArk, or a Centrify, a Remediant, or a Psychotic. Those are some, some major ones in the market. Asif, do you mind telling everyone a little more about what PAM solutions can do? Um, and if folks specifically already have a PAM footprint, how can they leverage it in the near term to better safeguard privileged access? Sure, yeah, absolutely. Um, so with, with PAM, or a privilege access management, we are essentially enforcing the notion of uh, principle of least privilege, which uh, basically involves you control, validate, and restrict access rights for users and their accounts to only the resources that are absolutely required to perform their day-to-day um, -day routine or authorized activities. Um, organization, if you have a, a, a PAM process, uh, I will kind of kind of talk separately about what a PAM process is and then what a PAM solution can do that can enforce a privilege access management process. At the minimum, organization must have a privilege access management process to enforce the principle of least privilege. Um, this may also in involve using a PAM product like Stephanie mentioned to achieve sub such goals. Um, organizations must ensure their workforce and non-workforce who need privilege access are using uh, a PAM product for accessing the system. Uh, if you don't, if you're using PAM product only for the as, as a as a secure vault to checking in and checking out the password, you should consider them to uh, expand that umbrella while accessing systems as well. You know, keep you know, and uh, you know, start looking into using session management with all of these PAM systems offer um, to to while you're controlling access into these uh, systems. Um, so have uh, multi-factor authentication in this coupled with this PAM process, right? And one of the example I previously mentioned is when they access have two FA process when you're launching a PuTTY or an RDP session. Um, you know, uh, you know. Finally, you know, you should also, if you have not, invest in a PAM product. These days, we all know about CyberArk, but these days, like Stephanie mentioned, you have Remedian, Psychotic, um, and and these are like 
SaaS and other SaaS type products that are very effective in doing the job. And not only that, they they, they also guarantee a shorter uh, ROI as well while you implement uh, big time solutions. Yep. Yeah, thank you, Asif. So um, just on the topic of, of privileged access, another thing you can do in the near term, even if you don't have a technology solution in place, there are, um, there are, you know, you can have an MFA solution, a PAM solution, for for instance. If you do not, you can look towards your audit and your compliance teams to begin to routinely review privileged access. So do user access reports. Look at systems that are considered to house your sensitive data and just start looking at that information a little more frequently to make sure there's not any um, any suspicious access that's happening. Again, that's more of a report review kind of thing. They're called certification reports. If you have a governance tool in place, like a sale point is an example of a vendor that does this, you can automate that process of doing digital user access campaigns or uh, they're called attestation or certification reports. You could roll it out even easier if you have a governance tool already. If not, you could export, uh, export these types of reports into a CSV file like you would for a SAC certification, for instance. And just get your audits, uh, like I said, your audit and compliance teams to spend a little more time reviewing the privileged access specifically more frequently. Um, and I know we're running a little short on time, so we'll try to get through the rest of these pretty quickly. Uh, just to shift gears back to workforce, we want to talk a little bit about onboarding and offboarding. Uh, rapid offboarding is a challenge probably right now. If you are an organization that is hopefully not, but doing a furlough or a, um, you know, a layoff of some sort, then that's probably a use case that's a little relevant to you right now. We want to talk a little more about onboarding. And the reason we want to do that is because folks can't get into the office right now to get their laptop and to get their credentials. So, you know, this is a use case that we've, and we have seen a lot, um, just as our, our company has had to contend with a lot with our client base, even without a pandemic. Um, and we've come up with, with ways to be able to kind of work around that process. Um, let's see the next slide here. So we actually solved this in the past by creating a simple front end for users. This is something that we have today um, that allows folks to claim their credentials through a self-service mechanism that enforces user validation through MFA and push notifications, but also provides, uh, provides folks with user credentials once they've gone through a validation process so they can access their corporate resources day one from their job from an external facing UI um, so that they don't actually have to go into the office to go through that process. Um, full disclosure, this is a solution that does not ride by itself. It relies on information that sits in a backend identity management system. So you have to have an identity management system in place like this to work. Um, if you don't have one, this isn't really going to be relevant to you. If you do have like a sale point or an Oracle or a CA or whatever, Savient, that this would be something that, that would make sense. Um, also, maybe you can provide just a little more detail on how to determine if it's a viable near-term option for a company um, yeah. and how long would take us, uh, you know, how, how long it would take to actually make this thing work um, if you do happen to have an identity management system? Sure. Um, I'm trying to speed up because uh, you're running short of time. But, uh, you know, most organizations who have an identity management practice mo most likely have a process for onboarding their on-premise uh, or employee workforce, you know, that may also involve, um, you know, a, a process where a manager is handing over a uh, you know, a, new, a piece of paper with the new new hires, user ID and password, email, etc. But what we are basically, uh, you know, with this UI, where we are moving away is the concept of identity proofing, uh, where this UI is flexible, uh, where a new hire can, you know, claim their own identity and, you know, set their own password uh, during the process of, um, you know, knowing their user ID and email. Um, so where uh, this is effective is uh, this process not only works for employees, but also for non-employees and contingent workforce, uh, you know, other affiliate affiliations, etc. Uh, the, the powerful thing about this UI is kind of from a design principle standpoint is um, we, we, this UI does not use a backend database like Stephanie mentioned. It leverages your, on, uh, your existing identity management solution. So you're not storing data in multiple places. Not only that, uh, this UI is powerful in terms of its API hooks into your uh, corporate identity provider. 
um, such as uh, you know like a federation uh, you know like a federation system or um, it also is strong in terms of API hopes to integrate with your uh, MFA system as well such as Duo. Uh, where this comes in uh, handy is as part of the, the new hire be it employer or non-employee who when they claim their account and they set their password they are also registering for MFA as well so um, you know but, but consider this as part of your remote workforce you, you know um, in onboarding uh, or while the orientation is happening remote or a zoom or a webex session an employee or a non-employee is also claiming their account setting up their password signing up for MFA you essentially uh, and the end result is basically fully uh, positioning the, uh, the remote workforce to be effective and secure Yep, and it, and it, uh, my second question was about implementation time. So this, this doesn't take a lot. Of time, right? Yes, I'm it's sorry not. about that. Yeah, it's 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 a very light bite. To I, I as I mentioned, it does not require a, a database uh, backend, and, and this solution comes vetted uh, uh, for and it's embedded and it's fully has integration capabilities with all the, the modern. Uh, identity management products like uh, SailPoint, Oracle, CA, et cetera. So um, you build the build is already there, deployment implementation time is very minimal. All right, so contingents, we want to talk about them for a second just because they're they're high risk, like we said before. These All these folks, the contingent workforce, you know, they need access to your data. Um, a lot of times they're just accessing non-privileged data, but in some way, for a lot of these folks that are actually accessing very sensitive data um, and VPN licenses really aren't the most cost effective way to sort of manage this user group. Um, so Asif, can you just walk through some options that organizations have or what's the best practice to mitigate security exposures for the contingent workforce um, accessing you know, both privileged and standard resources since VPN really isn't the, the most common way of doing that or suggested way. Sure, sure, yeah, I'm not trying to beat the horn, but concept of zero trust is is what organizations should move towards um, this involves investing in a good identity provider uh, that can cap that can not only factor the user but also the device and the location weight characteristics when they're accessing the information um, you know use MFA for all the access that a, a non-employee or a non uh, workforce is going to access um, you know make sure that the device is if the device is not managed by the um, organization the the device origination and the user roles and the entity analytics is is taken in, in consideration as well uh, adaptive authentication in the form of the mfa must be in place to ensure unusual access behaviors that result in the mfa enf enforcement not just during the initial login but also during the course of the application as and when required yeah yeah excellent um, so, uh, very quickly, the risks of data collaboration. We did want to hit on this point because it is, it is really important. Um, just because it's, you know, I think it's safe to say that lots and lots of data is currently being shared and modified and distributed within your corporate community. Uh, I think it's even safer to say it's probably also outside of your corporate community, um, just because of the digital collaboration risks that um, exposures we already talked about. Um, the problem though with data collaboration or collaboration data is that most of it is unstructured. And what I mean about unstructured is that it's, um, you know, folks creating files and folders and Dropbox, SharePoint, whatever. Um, and, and typically they do that under the con uh, constraints of whatever your, your organizational policy is. But in this world right now, uh, what we've already heard of people doing is that they're taking corporate files and putting them into these unstructured data sources like a Dropbox accounts, that's a personal, and they're they're moving business information into those Dropbox accounts or those box.com accounts uh, because it's taking too long for the formal corporate share to be set up by the corporate IT department. Um, so how do you really manage un unstructured data? Um, that's kind of what we wanted to touch upon really, really quickly. And if you can stay over time, that's great. We're gonna, we're gonna do this and finish this up and then uh, folks can always reference the recording that, that we'll have up online, but we did want to cover this because uh, it is a really important point. Unstructured data is, is really high risk data because you can't track it in the same way that you can structured data. Um, so Asif, do you mind just talking a little bit about uh, how, how organizations can really reduce the risk around the unstructured data elements like file shares? Sure. Uh, by, by unstructured data, what we're essentially talking about is having a data governance policies around 
the the the, um, the data itself, right? What is sensitive? What is non-sensitive? Uh, who who is the owner of this particular set of data, etc.? Uh, why? Because people are creating files and folders more so ever, right? With, with the collaboration software is in place, uh, they are rapidly creating information, sharing it and sensitive data. While you're working in this space and environment, uh, you also lose track of what is sensitive and what is not. So you need to have a process uh, around something that constantly monitors these data, uh, enforces the data governance policies. You know, tools such as Veronis or SailPoint has a product called File Access Manager can do so. Uh, while we have that, uh, you know, what is also important is to couple the data governance with identity governance as well. So we have a pro which, which, for example, most uh, identity management pro products such as SailPoint can do it. Uh, what we are trying to say is, in addition to knowing what your identity or workforce has access to, uh, which is a digital data, but all, uh, in terms of uh, you know entitlements and so on, also have a clarity on what uh, an identity has access in terms of unstructured data, right? Uh, detect anomalies, make sure that they only have access to the right information that should have access to. Um, you know, also couple that information, uh, extend that integration to a same tool such as Plunk to monitor events, right? If, if a sensitive data is being uh, accessed at a time that they shouldn't, um, that comes into a different uh, uh, authentication pattern or access pattern, uh, make sure that sets up notifications or, or, or a workflow that triggers a specific set of action or actions. Uh, finally, have a, a dashboard analytics like tool like Tableau or Click um, that can that can read information from your Splunk system and can display um, you know patterns of the user access user uh, while they are accessing unstructured data, and and all of this coupled can help you reach uh, you know uh, yes with a good security posture where where with that end you know mature goal of knowing who has what access what they are trying to access. And uh, and the type of user who are trying to access as well. You did a really good job of speaking quickly, Asa. Thank you. So we have like what we have one other major thing to talk about, which is supporting the help desk. Um, yeah. So chances are your service desk is probably overwhelmed right now. You know what we were thinking about is folks who've never worked remotely before are now doing so. So naturally, you know, service desk is going to be at high times for for you know forgotten password calls, um, anything like that. You know, is going to kind of create an increase with your service desk if you're tracking that. You know, it's very possible that that's already happening. Um, so we were thinking about ways to reduce the stress on your help desk. And ultimately, the best way of doing that is to automate as many of your functions as possible. Some of this you might already be doing, but anything around self-service is certainly going to help. Like self-service password management controls will absolutely reduce that overload on the help desk, as well as access requests. So when folks are requesting access, sometimes people have forms that folks can fill out digitally. Uh, identity governance administration solutions. Um, actually help quite a bit in that area as well. They provide that feature and function. Automatic user lifecycle management, so identity management, uh, IGA. Uh, again, like the tools we mentioned, like a sale point um, does that stuff automatically. If you don't have that software, you know, that's going to remain a manual process and that's okay. It's, this is just more of a in the future because this probably won't be the last time that that something happens in our world that creates a situation in which we have to suddenly shift the way we do business. These types of identity and access management solutions really help um, in a time like this because the automation is immediately going to take the stress off of your administration, uh, your, your administration folks, as well as your operational staff and ultimately your help desk as well. Um, Asif, do you want to talk a little bit about um, whatever we can talk about in the next minute? <laughs> so self-service yeah. access requests, certainly. The certifications yeah, but, we already talked about. Um, just very yeah, so the, the, the one one word, um, like Stephanie mentioned, that, that can help you, you know, have a painless help desk staff is, uh, is automation, right? Automation, not only that, invest in, you know, like, like we talked about in the previous slides, invest in good identity providers. Good news is not only there are pretty uh, great identity providers like Okta, Ping, uh, they are also pretty, pretty quick to implement, right? You, you can, you're looking at a few weeks to implement basic access to most of your critical application, and then you can look into expanding that footprint across multiple applications. 
And all of these uh, enable you to have um, self-service password management, um, self-service access requests, and so on. For example, case in point, identity, uh, SailPoint has a product called Identity Now, which can do password management, password synchronization. Um, the Identity Now can also extend to a full-fledged IGA in the cloud product where users can do self-service access requests. And it can also do automated user lifecycle management as well. Um, in a certification, uh, you know, in the last two, three years has turned out to be a burden for managers because they are reviewing all the access of a user. But, you know, I think we, it's important to look certification uh, or the entitlement as a data and not user access. What I mean by that is try to look into pattern, you know, while you have to satisfy the SOCs and audit and stuff like that. But from a security process, you need to figure out patterns, right? Right. have a way to classify privilege access, first of all, right? Yeah, most uh, sales IGA platforms like SailPoint can help you do that. Uh, launch certifications on only those um, so that the, the your managers or the application owners can only review a handful of users who, um, you know, who need to review, who, who have privilege access. Not only that, split that into workforce and non-workforce. So their extra focus can be given on, on those identities specifically. And finally, uh, leverage a, the, the products these days can do AI or machine learning uh, on, the, on the data itself. So they can detect uh, anomalies as to uh, the type of user who, the few set of users who stand out with respect to access and more so a bigger red flag for uh, uh, non-employees that who have those specific or privileged access. So a combination of uh, data classification coupled with the identity governance and a strong access management could greatly um, solve the problem we are in and make life easier and seamless, uh, you know, as, as, we, as we move through this crisis situation. And some of it is not that, that time consuming either. Self-service password management, we actually have a customer of ours that did this because of COVID and it's a three week process. And that three weeks is mostly change management and communications to the end users because that's a huge change for your end users. Less so the technology, the actual technology uh, integration, it takes not a lot, I mean, it's like days of effort, not not months of effort. It's it's really just managing the, um, the non-technical pieces, you know, i.e. your user community, just knowing there's a change coming. So it's a few weeks of time, but a few weeks is not a lot in the grand scheme of things. Some of the stuff you actually can do in the near term, um, but it, you know, some of it is obviously a little more, a little more time consuming and takes months. But the password management piece, single sign-on, that's stuff you can do pretty easily right now. And so I know we're over time. We just wanted to wrap up with giving everyone on, um, and we'll have this up for rec uh, as a recording, so you can reference it. But we wanted to give everyone a, a good one page view of a lot of these software vendors are offering free free trial periods um, for software that you can use. So we said SSO is something you can do pretty quickly. So same with uh, multi-factor authentication. Um, there's a lot of free stuff out there right now that you can use. And a lot of organizations might not be aware of it. Go to these vendor websites and look into it. These are pretty amazing deals where they're allowing folks to use software for six months, no risk. So if you cancel after six months when this crisis is over, you can do that, it's okay. Um, there's some limitations to what they're allowing you to do, of course, but this is the ability to to actually, uh, if you don't already have this technology in place within your organization, you actually can go get that technology to deal with what's happening right now, which is uh, speaks highly of the vendors, uh, the software vendors that are uh, offering this up. So we just had a few up here that we knew about. Uh, again, this is accessible online and you can certainly go to the vendor websites to learn more, but we just wanted to give everyone sort of a one page view of what we know about. Um, and if you have any questions, or uh, please reach out, you know, through our website, we'll be more than happy to follow up with questions on a, a personal basis, an individual basis, but we appreciate everyone giving us the full hour, um, and good luck, everyone, stay healthy, hope everyone uh, stays okay during this time, and uh, we'll, we'll speak to you soon, thank you. Thanks, thanks everybody, stay safe.